I'd like to introduce our first speaker who will do more to frame uh, today's conversation, Jim Lockhart, who many of you know is Vice Chairman of W.L. Ross and Company, LLC, and the co-chair with former Senator Kent Conrad of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Commission on Retirement Security and Personal Savings. If you haven't already read the Commission's report, I highly encourage you to do so. It's um, a, a great collection of smart and pragmatic policy recommendations. Jim's full bio is in your packets, as are the speakers, as are the bios for all the speakers today. Um, but I'll note that it's very impressive and uh, that he once served as a lieutenant on a nuclear submarine, which I did not know. So we'll be sure to ask him about that later. Um, Jim, thanks so much for being here, and the podium is yours. Thank you, David, and thank you for the plug for our report. That's, we always like plugs like that. So. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad that we at the Bipartisan Policy Center could co-host this event with our friends at Aspen and Pew, both of which are doing terrific work on retirement security. There are a great many issues grabbing headlines these days, but today's subject, the challenges employees and owners of small businesses face in the area of retirement security, matters to hardworking people in this country and will continue to matter, uh, hopefully even after some of the flashier messier stories have faded. Indeed, a recent Gallup poll found that about 54% of working age Americans are either very worried or moderately worried about not having enough money for retirement. These concerns cross generations. One found that a much higher share, 76% of retiring baby boomers, are worried they haven't saved enough for retirement. Our friends at Ebre use a detailed model to project the that 40% uh, of Generation Xers will run out short of money in retirement. People can choose for themselves whether they want to call this a crisis, uh, but I think we can all agree that there is a significant problem here. And despite the fact that the younger gener generations will need to rely more on their defined contribution savings for retirement income than their parents did, a recent report from Vanguard found that employees under age 25 have actually lowered their savings in recent years, not increased them. Now, I would be remiss to imply that the current system is broken for everyone, because that is not the case. By far, too many Americans have been left behind. And we, as we will address today, this is especially true for employees and, uh, of small businesses. As David said, we have known these flaws in the retirement system for decades. Over the years, many of us inside and outside of government have devoted our time to improving policy in a way that will enable more Americans to live comfortably in retirement. In a recent example, uh, as David mentioned, Senator Conrad and myself and a ter terrific group of commissioners at the Bipartisan Policy Center I've been attempting to raise awareness around these topics because, unfortunately, amidst the breaking news about tax reform, health care, tweets, uh, America's growing retirement program problems uh, are getting buried. Hopefully, our discussion today will help rectify that. Our commission uh, at the BPC released its comprehensive final report last summer entitled Securing Our Financial Future. I won't go into all the details today, but again, I encourage you to look at it. One of the keys to our commission work was recognizing that small businesses are central to the gap in, in accessing to retirement savings. Overall, about two-thirds of all U.S. workers have access to work, workforce plans, but less than 30 percent of employees in small businesses do. Uh, small businesses defined as less than 100 employees. Uh, and while businesses with over 100 employees have, uh, the employees have about 80 uh, percent availability. So there's a real divide there at the 100 employee level. And, and in my opinion, it's really unacceptable. Millions of tens of millions of American workers lack access to workplace retirement plans because all Americans should, I, I believe, should have at least a, a minimum ability to save efficiently for retirement. And, and as you know, much of this shortfall can be attributed to the substantial burdens small employers face when attempting to establish retirement plans. These obstacles, financial, administrative, legal, make it difficult for employers to offer plans even if they want to. 
The challenges they encounter include selecting the plans, maintaining records, hiring trustees, considering fiduciary li liabilities, and negotiating and paying relatively high fees. As a result, offering retirement plans is often too expensive and time consuming for many small businesses who want to spend their time running their businesses. At one point in my career, I actually started a small business, a risk management firm. And I, we did start on a 401k, but it was extremely expensive and burdensome. Uh, and so I under, really understand that there is a significant issue there. As we will hear from our first panel, the latest research backs this up. Without stealing the thunder from our friends at Pew, their recent survey of small business owners found that of those businesses not offering retirement plans, most cited the main reason as ex their either expense or administrative burden of a 401k plan. Once again, these figures highlight the need for meaningful policy reforms. Key to solving these problems in our commission's view was establishing what we call the retirement security plan. It's a really a version of an open multiple employer plan wherein small businesses can pool together nationwide and offer a plan run by a third party administrator. Retirement security plans would also remove the fiduciary responsibility of offering a retirement plan from small businesses. Under these plans, offering a qualified retirement plan would only require the employee to really forward the payroll contribution, uh, making providing a retirement plan simple for small businesses. The corner hardware store is in the business of providing people with tools and supplies, not studying up the intricacies uh, and liabilities of a retirement plan. Unfortunately, much of the recent retirement policy focus on Capitol Hill has been f focused on tax reform. The possibility of so-called Rothification for 401ks has alarmed many stakeholders and will likely resurface even if not acted upon uh, this time around. But I'm excited to share with you that we are right now providing, we at the Bipartisan Policy Center are providing support to several bipartisan members of Congress who are drafting legislation that would truly help small businesses provide their employees with greater retirement security. As you'll hear today, our solutions are not the only solutions. Many others exist. We are pleased to have a full slate of very high caliber experts to share their valuable insights, including perspectives from small business, industry, public officials who are working to expand access via state-run retirement plans. The, the cutting-edge innovations and research discussed by the panels today have the potential to dramatically increase access to retirement benefits for small businesses. Together, we will show that the goal of expanding retirement plans to the hardworking owners and employees of small businesses is really within reach. With that, I thank you again for being here, and I'd like to welcome up John Scott and the first panel. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's great to be here, and I just want to say, again, thanks to our co-organizers, the Aspen Institute and the Bipartisan Policy Center, and especially to David Mitchell, who uh, did a great job uh, pulling all this together on behalf of Aspen. Um, as Jim mentioned, we are we do have a great uh, panel of experts uh, here, and we're going to focus with this first panel on the barriers to offering uh, retirement benefits. Um, and as David mentioned, the bios are in your handouts, uh, so I won't go through those today. But I am joined uh, by uh, at the far end, uh, Rep. Buttle, who's a senior fellow of the Aspen Institute's Financial Security Program and uh, principal at Public Private Strategy. Uh, and then we have Holly Wade, who is Director for Research and Policy Analysis at the National Federation of Independent Businesses. And then uh, to my immediate right, Alan Gutierrez, who is the Associate Administrator of the Office of Entrepreneurial Development and Small Business uh, Administration. So um, the format is going to be largely conversational. Um, I will start off with a few high-level points uh, that will just basically follow uh, that slide. That's my only slide, which people who know me. That's an achievement. <laughs> uh, so just uh, some points from some recent survey work uh, that we have done around small businesses. And then I'm going to be turning to my fellow panelists to sort of get their perspectives on the barriers that small businesses face in trying to offer retirement benefits to their workers. Um, 
So Pew did a survey of small business owners and uh, key decision makers. Uh, this was done over 1,600 small businesses. The average firm size was 28 employees. And we sampled both those that offered retirement plans and those that did not. We really wanted to get both sides of that picture. Um, so that first bullet, retirement benefits are not first. Um, this is one of the things that we learned is, you know, retirement plans are not the first offering that businesses typically offer. In our sample, is a little more than half uh, offered a plan. Um, many businesses are much more likely to offer paid time off and health insurance, which makes sense. When you're starting a business, uh, you're going to be offering benefits that have an immediate value or need from your workforce. Um, but at some point, businesses do get to around to offering retirement benefits. So why do some offer plans? and why do others do not. Um, in terms of plan sponsorship, um, our survey identified a few key characteristics associated with offering a plan. For example, when employers reported that earnings increased a little or a lot over the past two years, um, they were 41% more likely to offer a plan than if earnings had remained flat. Uh, in addition, a firm with more full-time workers is more likely to adopt a plan than uh, a workforce that's more evenly divided with full-time and part-time workers. And incorporated businesses are almost twice as likely to offer retirement plan than unincorporated businesses. So I think you can see a theme there around sort of financial stability and growth as being sort of key uh, factors. The other question is when is a firm likely uh, to start a plan? Well, the chance of offering a plan is quite low at startup, we found, but it does increase as the firm uh, as a firm grows in size, uh, whether that's the number of employees or the age of the firm. Um, but that probability uh, begins to level off when a firm reaches about, uh, for example, 75 employees. And a similar dynamic is in terms of the number of years in business. So these results suggest that businesses tend to adopt plans during a middle phase of growth. After startup um, and during a period of expansion, um, at such times, a retirement plan might be an attractive tool for hiring and retaining talented employees uh, when they've already provided those immediate benefits that I mentioned, like health insurance. But as, at a certain point, the likelihood of adopting a plan does not change despite continued growth. So then uh, we get down to, oh, well, I can now hear myself. <laughs> uh, so in terms of the main reasons for offering a plan, why do uh, small businesses offer benefits, uh, retirement benefits? In our survey, Employers could indicate more than one reason for offering a plan, but then we asked them to indicate the main reason uh, for offering a plan. Almost all, 96%, cited a desire to help employees save for retirement, and 48% 48% identified it as the main reason. And this really solidified things we heard in focus groups that we conducted around the country, that you know these business owners, they're, because they're small, they see their workers every day face to face, and they get to know them. And there's a real desire to help them be financially whole. Um, the second main reason that was cited at 31% was attracting and retaining workers. And then other reasons like tax advantages or employee demand were not nearly as important uh, to our sample of small business owners. So barriers to starting a plan. Um, we asked why, uh, if, if they didn't have a plan, why they didn't offer one. As Jim mentioned, the, the top two reasons were it was too expensive to set up and a lack of administrative resources for maintaining a plan. And you can understand with small businesses, the owner or the, the manager, they're wearing different hats and something as complex as a retirement plan is, is a lot to take on. So I think that second reason of uh, lack of internal resources is, is an important one. Uh, in terms of motivations for starting a plan, uh, we wanted to know what would cause those non-plan sponsors to start offering one. And 67% said increased business profits would make them somewhat or much more likely to start a retirement plan in the future. And 60% said they would be somewhat or much more likely to start a plan if there were increased business tax credits for doing so. Um, increased employee demand uh, came in uh, as a third cited reason. Conversely, majority said that the availability of easy to understand information, tax advantages for key employees, or reduced administrative requirements would make them no more likely uh, to offer a plan. So that's, that's sort of a, a quick sketch of our uh, research. Um, what I'd like to do now is sort of turn to our panel who've been very patiently waiting. Um, so 
I'm going to be asking each of them a question, and the other panelists will have a chance to sort of chime in on that question, and I'll sort of go through uh, the different folks. I'm going to pause and see if there are questions from the audience, because I do want folks here to, to have a chance to, to join the conversation. So, you know, start thinking about a question. We have microphones that will come around so that people on the web will be able to hear you. But let me start off, uh, Alan, uh, asking you the first question. Um, you know, you have a lot of experience uh, with small business, and you've been observing the field for quite some time. Um, can you just describe what are the barriers for employers, you know, uh, going back over time, and how does that compare to today uh, for trying to offer a retirement plan or, or sponsoring a plan? Has anything really changed, uh, or what's new? Yeah, great. Uh, good morning. Glad to be here, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, before I answer that question, I was just curious, I was looking at the audience, and and um, kind of a testing here, like uh, informal. Are, how many of you all are participating in a 401k plan? All right, so everyone raise their hand so you're not in trouble, right? So <laughs> it's good you're here, right? So, uh, and that's always, a, I, I think, a barometer too in terms of it, you know, and, and we understand it. And, and I, I think from, from my perspective, um, uh, being when I was in the corporate side and, and working for uh, in the financial services arena, um, one of the things that's very interesting that I was looking back and, and thinking about this was that um, back then, uh, in terms of uh, uh, retention, you know, in terms of uh, or attracting new employees, uh, the, the, the notion, and specifically I had the West Coast region, so California, Utah, uh, Nevada, Arizona, and, and uh, Oregon, and, and Washington State, so primarily those uh, key areas, in terms of, of penetrating and, and uh, uh, getting into the market uh, in the emerging markets area, right? So, uh, uh, Hispanic owned businesses, African American, Asian, and LGBT as well. And one of the things was back then was um, it was healthcare, right? Healthcare was the number one. Now, that was number one uh, in terms of retention. Hey, I have a better healthcare plan. Um, this is the one that, you know, I, it's offered to you as an employee and so forth. And not so much on the 401k or retirement uh, field overall, right? So, it was one of those. Challenges and, and for me, I was coming from uh, managed care and healthcare for many years with Aetna as well, and I transferred over into the financial services area. Um, so I saw that as as back then a, a, a the number one thing is if the you know a small business owner uh, wearing a lot of different hats and he or she um, was looking how to keep their employees because it costs a lot to you know bring on new employees and so there was that fact. I think fast forwarding now. Um, healthcare is kind of already kind of it's part of your benefits package to a certain degree. Um, I'm not going to get into the recent, you know, overall ACA and what's good and what's bad, but I, I think that that's always now a part of the package, right? Where now then employers are now um, looking at additional tools in, in the 401k and other avenues to be able to address and, and offer to them that aspect. So I see that as part of it now. It's a, back then it wasn't, and now, so certainly now. In terms of your studies and others, as we know, in terms of the cost, that's the other part. You know, back then, that that was always a barrier, and I think that doesn't change as well too now, um, with other factors involved for small business and you know managing and juggling their their business. Holly or Rhett, do you want to chime in on that question before I give you a specific one, or any thoughts about what what's changed over time? Um, well, for one of the areas that we've looked at. Um, I've heard from many of our members over the last 13 years that I've been at NFIB. We represent about 300,000 small business owners, mostly employers. And looking at the changes in compensation packages, generally speaking, we've seen a huge decline in the percent of owners offering health insurance. And so having a compensation package that is available to attract and retain employees um, which is becoming increasingly more difficult with the tightening of the labor market and all of these areas. Um, there is, I feel, maybe there's room and an opportunity for small business owners to offer a retirement benefit. Um, everything seems to be going kind of the way of defined uh, contribution with, even with health insurance, if they're allowed going forward um, without being penalized. Um, and and going that way with, with retirement with 401k offerings, um, I see huge opportunities in that area. Um, as I said, especially with the, the, the staggering decline, I think it's about 
15 percentage points in the last 12 years of the smallest employers offering health insurance. It was in the 40s and now we're in the 20s. Um, and so they're, they still need a way to um, help retain and recruit employees and this is a good opportunity. One of the other avenues that I think is important um, is the number, the percent of small employers that use payroll services. So about 30% of small employers use payroll services. If they offer, if they use a payroll service, they're far more likely to offer benefits because they have resources that help them. But um, to John's point, they have to be stable. They have to feel that they can continue offering these benefits um, to even start the conversation with their employees of whether this is, um, a, you know, a good direction for their business. But payroll um, and the decline in health insurance, it's an ever-changing mixture of how they're developing their compensation packages and their ability to offer um, different types of comp compensation packages for their employees. I think the only thing I'd like to add, <clears throat> I'd like to come back and talk a little bit about sort of the, the vastness of the small business universe when we talk about small business, because I think it's really important that we segment the industry but on this specific piece I think you know what I hear when I talk to a lot of small employers is really the relationship between the employer and the employee is changing in a new way especially when we talk about millennial employees and so I think you know decades ago when we when we thought about benefits a lot of times employees would say you know the boss has made a decision and you know I've kind of trusted them and it's it's sort of the right thing and you know they're doing everything they can I think what I hear from a lot of small employers, particularly around those who are hiring millennials, is millennials want to be much more engaged in the decision-making process. They also want to know much more about what employers are offering. And so they are coming to their employers in kind of a new way and saying, you know, how's our benefits package structured? I'm really interested in, you know, X or retirement. And I, I think it includes a whole slew of benefits, not just retirement. But I think that new level of engagement from the employee is interesting and driving a different conversation than maybe we weren't seeing a few decades decades ago in terms of how employers think about their benefits offerings. Do, do you think technology is part of that too? That I mean, I'm going to show my age that, you know, when I wanted to learn about benefits or, you know, mutual funds, <laughs> I had to get a book from Consumer Reports, you know, it, it was a little cumbersome way to find yeah. out about that, yeah. you know, but, but I think today it's much easier to get that information and do your due diligence. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, particularly millennial employees just think about the world of benefits different with the tools and resources, you know, that they have available to them. And I think, you know, as... It, you know, I think the one thing we can't ignore is we don't obviously need to get into a debate about the Affordable Care Act, but it's, it's changed this, the delivery mechanism. We've gone from a business-to-business -business sort of marketplace to maybe even more of a business-to-consumer marketplace where the consumer has much more options, and I think that will create and is creating sort of a way, a change in the way that we think about how the structure of benefits is offering, and I think it particularly with younger employees. Holly, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, much as I like to think that Pew is the last word on, on everything whenever we do research, <laughs> uh, but I know you've been doing uh, research for a long time um, at NFIB and uh, both ex external to your membership as well as internal uh, surveys of your membership. And so um, I really wanted to get your thoughts about, you know, I've identified some barriers from, from our survey, but you know, what do you hear either anecdotally or from your research from your membership or um, other sources about you know, just are there other barriers that I didn't mention or things that you would highlight uh, from your work? I think one of the areas that we've found in talking to our members when they're thinking through what a compensation package looks like is, well, as you mentioned, the complexity often of offering a, a retirement benefit. And especially mm -hmm. for those firms who have high turnovers and or lower wage industries where they're talking with their employees or they are assuming that they're employees, um, it could be a mixture of both, that they want more in their paycheck. They want more in their paycheck. That's their focus in um, hiring and attracting uh, uh, employees to, or, or candidates to fill open positions. And so that's the main driver is, you know, more in, um, in disposable income. Um, so there's a lot of kind of internal uh, differences between small business owners. As Red said, you know, they are vast and diverse, and and their employee compensations are the same. You know, whether they're 
they are hiring, um, you know, temporary workers, uh, uh, high turnover rates, seasonal. Seasonal is huge. So if it becomes more complex in offering a retirement benefit, if you have seasonal employees in uh, having a lot of paperwork or having a lot of uh, hoops to jump through in the beginning and end of, of offering a retirement benefit, that's always going to be a problem for small business owners in the time that it takes to uh, maintain that benefit for their employees. No, I was going to add to that, and you know how uh, Rhett was talking about millennials, that's the, the positive <coughs> side in terms of uh, the ability of, of wanting to know more and, and, and get more information and the access of it too. But if you go one step further down then in terms of the barriers, especially small businesses, it, it, is there the demographics in, in their base, right? So mm -hmm. if you tend to have more in... Uh, you know, an Hispanic uh, a workforce or, or emerging market workforce, there's that other additional challenge in terms of culture, right? Yeah. Culture change in yeah. that aspect. And you have, you know, where, you know, my, my dad now, he's retired, but, you know, I would, was drilling him way back then, you know, start and be part of the 401k and do it. But there's always this notion, especially in the Hispanic community, for example, is like, why am I going to save? I, I want to live day by day and I'm not here. I'm not sure if I'm going to be here tomorrow. So that doesn't makes me no good. I want to use all the money I can now, right? Um, but you, you try to you know educate them and get them, and so that's always a, another challenge too, because mm -hmm. the participation rate uh, within your workforce as a small business owner, and and year end you don't pass all the testing, and then what happens, right? You got to look at what are the the avenues to to pass testing, and sometimes the business owner, small business owner. Uh, it comes back to you and says, well, now I have to do this, or now I have to do this compliance, or return money back to employees, uh, or the higher cost, uh, uh, higher executives. Um, it becomes then a dysfunctional, right? Because they're like, what, what's the benefit if I'm putting all this time and effort as a small business owner, I'm wearing a lot of different hats, and then that year end, we're not doing well. My response to that when I was doing that in terms of account manager and, and sales and so forth was, look, you got to dedicate time to it, right? We need to have an opportunity to take them off the lines to be able to educate them. It's not going to happen overnight, but, you know, once every six months, we bring a team out here, get them to understand, or someone that has already participated, use them as an example because it's very hard to crack that. You know, the other part, last thing I was going to say is in terms of the Hispanic community, too, is some don't even have uh, checking accounts, and, and we see it as a norm, right? They don't even have checking accounts, right? So there's that challenge as well, too, uh, of wanting money uh, right away instantly and not in the institutions coming from countries that you can't uh, um, depend or trust the government, too. So there's all those different barriers, too, for the small, bus small business owner um, uh, uh, providing the, a great benefit tool, but then also making sure that it's running smoothly and moving forward and growing, too, in that aspect. So. That, that part I wanted to interject as well. Well, I, and I think that's a great point. One thing I didn't mention from our research is that, you know, we, we asked people, business owners, their familiarity with different kinds of retirement plans. You know, a lot of people have heard about the 401k, and that mm -hmm. did come out in the survey, but programs that are more geared towards small business owners, like mm -hmm. Simple Plans, mm -hmm. you know, SEPs, um, the now defunct MyRA, uh, but nobody really had heard about those. And so I think this idea of engagement that's continuous, um, you know, how does the plan work, what's appropriate for your business, and then that follow-up and understanding testing and sort of those gruesome details. Yeah. Uh, never a fun topic to go through, but, but yeah. Yeah, and I would just add, I think, you know, we should also think about the small employer also as a vehicle, and so I think when we when we think about the small employer a lot, we're often thinking about what works for the small business, and as a small business advocate, I'm a huge fan of that, but we also have to recognize that there are going to be small businesses who can't offer plans but might be able to be a vehicle to their employees, and so I think some of the state-based solutions that we're seeing, for example, in Oregon and in California and other places, I've seen really successful models where the employer almost serves as the convener because, so, so yesterday I was chatting with a mutual friend of all of ours, Christy Arslan, some of you may know her, she runs a small business, the Pop Republic popcorn truck that drives around DC, and she said something like really interesting to me. She was like, you know, it, it, she has, I think they have three stores in the Virginia area, you know, she was talking about sort of all of the things that they do for their employees, and she said it's so much more than a paycheck. We help some of them find housing, we help some of them do these things. They've really become this sort of role of convener, and I think as we, we think about 
the public policy challenges we have with the small employer community, there are ways that small employers can really help their employees um, get access to certain benefits. And so I think the small employer, um, in addition to thinking about policy that's smart for them, we also have to think about um, policy that's smart for their employees and how they can potentially be an avenue to, to reaching their employees. Because we know really it's people who work for small employers who are, um, who are in that coverage gap as we think about retirement. Yeah, and, and actually, um, I mean, that's an excellent point. And, but I want to get to a, back to a prior point that you raised uh, previously. And, you know, we keep using the word small employer or small business. And, you know, that encompasses a lot of, uh, you know, enterprises and firms and whatnot. So, you know, and I was excited to have you on the panel, uh, Rhett, to sort of maybe provide some perspective on, you know, what do we mean by, um, you know, how many are actually small, micro enterprises, can you just maybe talk a little bit about the differences and how that might impact you know, sure. some of these questions about barriers sure. to retirement? I'm going to ask Alan to keep me honest since, he, <laughs> since he's at the SBA. I mean, look, you know, the data is really different. And, and, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I think that's what's, it, if those of us who are small business policy dorks, we often joke around, like, you know, the biggest question in Washington is what is a small business? And if you look across federal and state legislation, I mean, it's it's completely different. So under the Affordable Care Act, we use 50 full-time employees and under, but for small business contracting, they use the upwards of 500 employees. Um, I think you're amazing if you have 500 employees. You, to me, you're definitely not a small business anymore, right? You're, you're quite frankly, you're a very large business. And so I think as we, we think about tools and public policy solutions and even private market innovations, we really have to understand the, the constituency that we're trying to craft um, the solutions for. And so, you know, the, the best data I've seen is, you know, we used to say it was 28 million. I think we're using the number 30 million now on small employers. But it's important to remember that the vast majority of those between 22 and 23 million, they're self-employed individuals. And so the vast majority of them are actually not employing people. Um, they may be hiring contractors throughout the year or doing a lot of subcontracts, independent contractors, things like that. But the vast majority of them are not em employing folks. So really, when we talk about the small employer option, um, we're really talking somewhere between six and eight million folks who are actually employing people. I think that's a really important perspective. And really, the vast majority of those are actually under 50. And so as we think about creating solutions, we really have to think about that market. Um, we're talking about really small firms um, as, we, as they're dealing with sort of the complexity of it. I want to ask if Alan or Holly have uh, anything they want to add to that question. But um, I would ask if you have a question in the audience, uh, could you raise your hand and that way we can get the microphones to you and we can turn right to you as soon as we're sort of done with this uh, line of questioning. But, you know, Holly or Alan, um, you know, this, this notion of what is a small business, I mean, do you see it uh, either from your membership data or from your interactions with SBA or before, you know, do you have a, a sense of how different perspectives or definitions of what is small, um, how that affects um, barriers to retirement or even solutions? First of all, Rhett did pass the test, so he's OK. OK, good. <laughs> he yeah. can stay. He can yeah. stay, yeah. <laughs> so he's good. Uh, I was going to say, um, from, from, and as Rhett mentioned, you know, the definition is 500 or less. You know, and, and you think about that, that's, that's a big business. That's thriving. So it all depends on the industry standards of that, that aspect. But one also thing in terms of what was mentioned, in two is that um, you look at um, uh, you know, the self-employed and, and the one or two shop kind of entrepreneur, but let's, they, let's say they end up growing and they're expanding and they continue to grow, right? That one thing too that becomes still uh, sometimes stuck in their mind is that they're not small, small anymore, right? So they, they, they think of that, that dream, that desire of entrepreneurship and their business growing and going to the next level and now they have 10 employees, 20 employees. And I saw a lot of times where they, they forgot that now they're growing and becoming a, a, a even more uh, and, and looking at the benefits and what are the things that can be as incorporated as you mentioned uh, in that sense. So that's the other part of it too as well as it, I ran into that a lot uh, in, in prior as well is like, you know, you're not a mom and pop that started with an idea and you're still that. You're now 100 employees, you need to have different vehicles, you need to look at different areas of, of, of doing it, from payroll services, from retirement. So that's another thing I would say in terms of small business. There's that drive, that internal, you know, entrepreneurship, take that risk and reward. Um, but it's interesting, fascinating too, that risk and reward sometimes doesn't uh, go over to what we're talking about today in that mm -hmm. aspect. Just to add on, I think um, one of the other interesting components is, I mean, with retirement benefits and also health insurance, is if they offer, the owner most generally participates in the plan also. So if they offer a 401k 
or any other type of retirement plan, the owner is also a participant. And so that's also a key factor because for a lot of business owners, it's looking at their employees' retirement, um, you know, health savings, all that. Um, but it's also looking at, you know, the products that they're interested in also because, you know, those are the same vehicles that they're using for their retirement. Um, it was interesting, my sister just moved to DC and the, the firm that she works for, they're about, I think they're around six years old and, and they offer health insurance and their story is so similar to what we've all been talking about. They offer health insurance to help recruit and retain employees and just last month the president of the firm asked her, so what do you think about whether we should offer bonuses? or a retirement package, or a retirement mm. benefit. And so there are competing benefits available out there. And she said, well, you know, bonus would be great. I'd spend that all tomorrow. This retirement package, I think, is probably a better, a better tool for me in the long run. So yeah, I support the, the you know, 401k benefit versus, versus a bonus. Um, but there are so many ways of an employer talking to their employees and offering up, you know, kind of a menu of options to see where, you know, they would best want their compensation package to look like. Um, but it was interesting that health insurance was the first one and then retirement was after the firm was more established and growing and becoming more financially stable that that was the next offer. Do we, do we have some questions? Uh, we have a couple in the back. Please use the mic and can you just identify yourself and, and then ask the question. Hi, I came in a little late. I don't know if you touched this. Uh, I'm Mindy Reiser, I'm a sociologist. I've evaluated community economic development programs, some of which involve small business in the US and overseas. I'd like to ask about the older worker now and how he or she fits into this retirement uh, possibility universe in terms of options, in terms of whether they already have a 401k, some may not. What kind of tailorings could employers do to this population? We know people are working longer. Some of them are well compensated and this is their dream career. Others are not, they're just trying to get by. So talk a little bit about this population segment. Yeah, so question about the older worker, a perspective on the older worker and, and how we might think about them in particular. Uh, you know, I would say it's actually a very pertinent question given uh, the wave of the baby boom yeah. moving through to retirement. Mm -hmm. And we do have some evidence that you know, programs like the ACA and, and others might be encouraging people to you know, move from a, a career with an employer to self-employment, um, what we've been talking a little bit about. Um, you know, as sort of a bridge career to re full retirement um, or even phased retirement at a career employer. So um, any thoughts or perspectives on uh, the older worker? Uh, jump ball. All at once. <laughs> I, I would say yeah. from SPA's perspective, I mean, certainly that is a, a new wave, right, a, a, a transformation on that sense um, that uh, looking at from those that either go into retirement or want to start a, new, a small business, right? Because they're either in retirement or want to branch out. So those are some of the things that we're looking at, thinking outside the box. So what are the areas that SBA needs to look at in terms of not only, you know, the young entrepreneur per se anymore or uh, and, and middle age, but also uh, uh, older community as well in that sense. So we're looking at all that in that aspect of, in terms of what, how does it, is it more from a, a, a virtual perspective of, of, of reaching out across the country or mm -hmm. through our different district offices, which we have 68 across the country. So that's kind of um, on, on our radar. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing I would add is that I, I can't remember the exact statistic, but I believe it's above 80% of small business owners actually are above the age of 50. Um, and it, it really is sort of in that stage where you've had like one or two jobs and you decide, you know, you've kind of decided like, I'm tired of working for the man or the woman and I'm gonna go out and do my own thing. And, you know, we see a lot of small employers actually uh, folks who start small businesses, right, dip into their retirement from potentially what was a good job to, you know, put forth the capital to start their businesses. So I think it's a really interesting, um, interesting concept you raise. It's less on the worker side, but but I think what we're seeing, folks, we did see under the Affordable Care Act a huge surge of people in the 50 plus community who, because they felt like they were in what we called job lock at the time, that you know they couldn't get health care elsewhere. That now that they were able to get so on the exchange, 
they did you know step forward and um, you know decide to start small businesses because of that they felt like they they weren't going to be discriminated against given their age given the new rules and so I think you know it, it could be an interesting model to think about because I, I would assume that someone um, who's in that age range when they're thinking about starting a business they probably think first a where am I going to get my health care if I go out and do this and then B what does this mean for my for my retirement and so I think it's definitely something we should be thinking through yeah and I, and I think it's an interesting question too I just you know, reflecting on it, there's sort of the pull of a new career and the opportunity you might be getting through, you know, first was Part D and then the ACA, um, reduced healthcare costs, you know, but I think it does raise the question of, well, there's also the issue of job loss. We do see people at the older ages losing jobs, and so they're getting pushed into sort of self-employment as well, involuntary. Um, but then there's also the issue of, and this is more generally for the self-employed, what's the technological platform for encouraging them to save? You know, we, that's one of the great things about working at an employer is you have an HR system, payroll deduction is extremely easy, you don't have to think about it. How do we reach you know, older or younger, uh, what I call contingent workers, self-employed? Um, that, that is a big question. So I'm sorry, Holly. Were you oh, no, um, we haven't looked specifically in our surveys of the age range of their employees and whether they offer, but we have seen that those firms who hire or employ a higher percentage of young employees are less likely to offer retirement benefits. So if they have if they're more established employee older, you know, over 40 versus, you know, having most of your employees be 20 sums um, they're more likely to offer retirement benefits, probably because they're more established, but also it certainly could be that that is what they think their employees are looking for as a, as a compensation package. Uh, was there another question? I saw it. There we go. Good morning. I'm Jim Gatz with the Treasury Department, and uh, it's good to be here and good to see you all today. I just had a question about the millennial issue we were talking about. Uh, occurred to me, kind of we're talking about it in terms of the demand for benefits at work, but you know, millennials are 35 years old these days, some of them, pretty probably owning businesses. I just wonder, is there any research about that segment of the business owners in terms of openness? Or it seems it may be, I mean, I was thinking that perhaps that um, think sort of like a longer term strategy around policy would be helping focusing on businesses that are going to be bigger businesses in the next decade or so that are managed by people who are enlightened millennials. So just curious if you've done any research on that or any thoughts about that. Well, for that demographic, the, the millennials, the 35, 30 to, I can't remember what age demographic, but they would be the younger business owners, so they would just be starting out. There aren't very many in that population. They're generally, as Rod said, about 50 and over. That's where you're getting most of um, the age demographic of a small business owner. So they're just by nature going to be newer, starting out, therefore less likely to offer um, more broad compensation packages until they become more established businesses. So that's always going to be a demographic challenge with newer businesses. That, that premise is correct with these this, this generation. Yeah, I, I think it's a good um, question. I haven't seen any research out there on it. Um, I know uh, some of you are familiar with Carmen Rojas, who runs a group called the Workers Lab out of San Francisco. They've been doing some interesting work um, uh, with bringing young CEOs under the age of 35 together to have conversations around, you know, what are the structures we should be putting in place between the employer and the employee. So it'd be interesting to sort of dive into that um, and, and see kind of what they're hearing. But I think, you know, the work is being done under the premise that these young folks who, who do start companies who are hopefully going to be much larger companies and, and I think in Silicon Valley we see some of that. Um, and sometimes we focus on that. I do think it's happening in other parts of the country. Um, is interest uh, is interesting in terms of you know how do we start having these conversations with them on early on in their lives and in their careers so that as they sort of grow they're they're thinking about um, how to make more of a connection uh, between sort of you know robust benefits and and uh, bringing bringing their workers wealth along with the business's wealth at the same time. Uh, do we have another question? Can get a microphone over there. I was looking at um, formerly with uh, the U.S. Small Business Administration Office of Advocacy uh, and AARP. Uh, I just had a question 
regarding uh, the issue of wealth and something that hasn't been discussed, especially in terms of small business owners, in terms of their business, the amount of business equity they have of, of their total wealth. And I, I believe that's, that's a factor in terms of whether businesses, business owners are going to actually invest in their own 401k or IRA, and whether in fact they'll make it available to their workers. So I think the issue of wealth in general is an important one here because uh, your retirement account is one aspect of your wealth. But business owners, many business owners, look at their business equity as their retirement. And, and if they're successful, they want to be able to cash in at the end, which isn't always easy, obviously, but is, it is an option and is something that should be addressed in terms of looking at small business, businesses in general and their workers. So the, the interaction between wealth, whether in a 401k or in business equity, um, how, how do you all see that uh, playing out? We produced a study or a survey in 2005, and we're redoing it, and hopefully it will be released by the end of the year, asking those questions about the owner's <coughs> retirement and how much of their retirement will they think will be um, uh, they'll have through equity in their business, through their 401k, through um, uh, inheritance, through any other measure, pensions from a previous um, previous job. Um, interestingly enough, about 15 years ago when we produced the survey, they said that about some of their retirement would be through the equity of their through their business. So most weren't banking on that being a significant part of their retirement. Certainly those higher profit businesses are going to offer uh, 401k packages to their employees and also participate in the program themselves. Um, and, and those that are, that are lower profit businesses won't. And, um, but it seems that in the, all the different categories for an owner, in their retirement savings, personally, they they're getting it from a whole different, a lot of different buckets, and so for all the categories that we offer them, it's always some, some of their retirements coming from a whole litany of different things, um, but for those that are larger, more profitable, more is coming from their 401k retirement or whatever type of retirement program that they have in their business that they offer. I was just going to add, I mean, it, it, this really gets back to sort of understanding our audience and what kind of business you're talking about because, you know, they're, they're, uh, as we're having the current conversation about the tax debate right now, there's a big question about, you know, pass-through entities, right, and how your business is set up. And so a lot of small employers are set up as LLCs, and so a lot of their money is, you know, they don't necessarily keep money in their business bank account or reinvesting in their business, it's flowing through their individual income. That doesn't mean that they're they're not saving it, but as they think about sort of you know where their cash and capital is stored, it, it really is about how their their business is set up. It would be a completely different structure if you're set up you know in uh, as an S corp. And so um, the business structure and kind of the size of business and the diversity of the business we're talking about, whether it's a high tech startup firm who employs 12 people who can offer a robust package versus the you know popcorn shop on the street. Um, so that's that's kind of where I see the diversity in terms of this. Uh, Alan, I wanted to ask you, and this might be a good segue to this. Um, you know, helping small business owners think through a lot of these issues. Uh, you know, I know in your office, uh, you oversee a lot of, you know, these entrepreneurial endeavors, and you, you know, the SBA, your office provides a lot of tools uh, for the entrepreneur um, to either start or grow their business after they've started it. So, you know, thinking about some of these issues that have been raised, I mean, what sort of resources do you think are, you know, that your office offers that's really important in, in addressing these? No, certainly. Uh, th there's quite a bit of resources. You know, I, I refer it lately. I've been saying that, you know, uh, the, the everyone commutes, you know, some that drive to, to work, right? So you got your standard lanes, right? You got um, what I say the three main lanes that we, we have within entrepreneur development is uh, you have SCORE chapters, which is 3,000 volunteers. And these are executive individuals, retired executives. However, that's changing as well for, for, for that segment of ours and that state uh, resource partner of ours because not only uh, the target market is 
uh, volunteers that have already retired from their industries, but uh, those that are still in the industry too. So we're also looking at from that standpoint. And they're available 3,000 uh, strong across the country to provide uh, guidance and, and, and direction for, for an entrepreneur or small business. We also have the small business development centers uh, that are across the country as well. Those are a thousand strong across the country, uh, provide uh, services, training, counseling as well. And then we have women business centers as well, over a hundred plus, uh, as, uh, that not only just for women, but primarily focusing on the women entrepreneur and, and, and helping them on uh, the counseling, the access to capital and so forth. So I would say those are the three main lanes that we have. But we also have in terms from the virtual perspective too, right? Um, that we're going to continue to expand and grow and, and um, really take it to the next level is uh, the SBA's learning center. And what we mean by that is that sometimes individuals might not have easy access to a, a, a district office or one of our resource partners. So we're mm -hmm. going to continue to expand and, and grow courses that will be available online uh, for those individuals in the rural communities as well. Great, and, and Holly or Rhett, I mean, I know, Rhett, you do campaigns around uh, with the really small uh, business owners, and Holly, you know, I don't know if you want to mention uh, any tools that your organizations provide or, or that may augment what SBA is doing. Uh, we have a number of resources. Um, I also wanted to give a big shout out to SCORE, big fan <laughs> of that program. Um, we. We suggest to many of our members to go to their to ask their local SCORE chapter um, for help in all the various um, resources that they offer um, in business operations. But we also have affinity programs with different companies to help them access um, uh, tools to help run their business and also resources, online guides in all the various areas through marketing and benefits and compensation and um, and you know all that we try to offer all the tools that we hear the most questions about in our members um, business operations okay any questions from the audience let me yes um, my name is Carl Pulzer and I have a project called the Center on Capital and Social Equity I just wondered I heard a lot of reasons why I heard a lot of reasons why a business might not want to do a pension plan and not a whole lot of reasons why it might want to. But at the top of, I, assuming that the business community is kind of Darwinian, the, you know, the, there are the strong and there are the weak. If you were to construct an incentive, government incentive, either financial or otherwise, to give to the business owner or individual proprietor, wouldn't, what, why wouldn't it create a bigger coverage gap? Because wouldn't the people predisposed to, to offering pensions take it? And wouldn't it not be big enough to help the people at the very bottom? Or would it? So, you know, the question is, some sort of public uh, policy intervention, wouldn't that just already help those that need it least, is maybe another way to, to put it. Um, so maybe thinking about, you know, how do we help those that need to help, need help the most? So. I think one of the, one of the ways, I mean, unfortunately, there's so many competing factors in operating a business that, that consume the owner's time um, through increased regulations in all other areas of business operations that constrict their their available time to then offer a you know a, a retirement benefit plan um, that they initially feel is complicated and complex and time consuming to implement anyway. So lowering the barrier to entry for offering these plans, I think, is the first step in all of this. Um, and the easier it is, the more they'll they'll be able to do it. Um, I think the the increase in business owners who use payroll services, where payroll services the the expense of implementing a payroll service is is, is declining. So, if they're able to go that route, it's easier for them to implement um, some of these more technical benefit programs. So, I think those are areas that can help. You know, Congress talking about rothifications of, 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 of retirement benefits is not helpful. <laughs> it scares everybody um, in, in their ability to offer attractive products to their employees. So lowering the bar of entry or the barriers of entry, I think, is, is the number one focus. You know, I, I would just, I'll let you guys chime in too, but just to underscore what Holly said, 
you know, when we did focus groups with business owners around the country before we did our survey, um, you know, we talked about different policy ideas. I know we have another panel that'll get into this in more detail, but whether it's MAPS or Ottawa IRAs, you know, to Holly's point, a lot of business owners told us, they said, you know, I can't do this on my own right now. I mean, I want to do it, but I can't do it. And, and I'm competing against firms that do have 401ks. So anything that might give me, you know, a little bit of a leg up would be super helpful. But so it's really thinking mm -hmm. about those barriers to, to entry yeah. that Holly talked about. And that's what I was going to say. So this panel was set up to talk about the barriers, and the next one's going to wow you on the solutions. But I think uh, <laughs> set no the bar high. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, it, it, uh, I think it gets back to creating the right public policy solution. And so the question is, you know, there's lots of uh, there's lots of proposed solutions on the table. There's the IRA, uh, auto IRA, um, and the, the opt out method, uh, which you know, in in cases where we've seen it, we've seen it potentially be very effective. Um, there's also a conversation uh, about tax credits, right, and whether a tax credit could be effective. But can you structure the tax credit in a way that it's not just folks who are in the know or folks who can get access to it, but it really helps the folks who are struggling to try to find the coverage, and that is the big question. And then there's, you know, a broader question about uh, requirement. Um, and so I think, you know, as we, as we move forward, um, first, I'd you know, like to applaud a lot of people in the private sector because I think there's a lot of innovative things going on to bring small <laughs> employers to the table on this, and I, I definitely think there are market and private sector solutions that we need to explore. I also think as we think about the public policy solutions, it really gets back to the point I was trying to make earlier, which is really focusing on the right size of business to make sure that the public policy solution that we're creating really benefits them and not necessarily businesses who are already able to offer these sort of benefits. Um, since we're starting to push open the door on solutions, we should probably sort of wrap up, but let's have one more question, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to the next panel. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alan, you mentioned uh, some of the attitudes and cultural issues within your community as far as uh, resistance to or knowledge about retirement plans you know, within small businesses in that community. And uh, oh, my name is David Greer, and I work in Wealth Management and Financial Advisory at Merrill Lynch, and we find these types of things across you know, all groups, generations, ethnicities, and so forth. And so I'm just wondering, you know, to the panel in general, um, of course, people, they have fear, they have concern, of course, it's an issue of time, resources. So any ideas as to how we can better educate, you know, people are looking for sort of unbiased opinions on what to do. Uh, they don't want to be necessarily sold on a particular plan, a particular package. So in terms of education, better populating the people, how do we, um, your ideas on how we accomplish that? Great, great question. I, I, again, I, I go back to a little bit back then, and I think it's still prevalent now, and you know, 24 seven, you know, seven days a week uh, as a small business owner, juggling and bottom line, and now, it, you know, it used to be benefits package, now it's like, what kind of social media pa uh, platform do I have? How am I comparing and, and, and uh, fighting against or competing against other uh, competitors and so forth. But I think also the commitment, right? The commitment of, of the financial institutions that are providing those tools uh, uh, and services, right? That it's not, I always say, not a drive-through approach, right? So it's not like, hey, we really want to be in your community. These are the vehicles. Business owners, you got to use our products. This is going to be great. We have it all nice and glossy. We have it online. We have it everything. And then a year or two later, uh, it, it goes away and then so you get that mistrust again you get that like why should I even though maybe the business owner still has the plan but you have those chances I, so I, I say part of it is a commitment and and and, the, um, and understanding it right having the right uh, you know um, representation uh, to target those particular communities that are uh, for that business owner or that small business owner so they can relate as to as well and, 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 and have that trust factor I, you know, I think we're at an interesting time, right, because we're at a time where, like, trust in a lot of institutions is low. And so, you know, the question is, you know, do we trust the information the government gives us? Do we trust the information all that? The, the one thing that I've seen has been the most interesting source of information for small business owners, and I think some of you know I used to run a small employer organization. It's small employers when they talk to each other. Right, those are the people they trust. Hey, I've got a good accountant. I have a good advisor. Can you recommend someone? And so I think, you know, uh, as we think about working with small employers, part of it is bringing them early into the process. 
Um, some of us were in Oregon recently for an event around Oregon Saves, and I was really impressed with the small employers around the table and how early the employers have been involved in the process and the feedback they're getting from the small employers. But then when you listen to the small employers talk to each other as a sort of a trusted resource, there's no one who can really be in a small business's shoes other than a small business owner. And you can do lots of things, you know, telebriefings, conference calls, different sorts of trusted messengers, but the people they trust the most are each other. And so I think figuring out how to link that up will be key to our education and outreach effort as we, as we uh, propose solutions on this. Uh, it reminded me of something from our focus groups. We asked business owners where they got information uh, about plans, how to start a plan, and someone said Facebook. And we also, we're in the observation room, we started to laugh, but they made the point that Facebook is their friends and that's who they go to because they trust them uh, very much uh, to your point, Rhett. So um, I think that's it for our time. So I want to thank the panel and then turn it over to Jeremy Smith. <laughs>